Very nice. A good kickoff to the session. So next, uh, we have Reshma Jagsi. Reshma is an associate professor at the University of Michigan, and she is going to talk about accelerated partial breast irradiation, a wonderful idea that maybe didn't go as well as we had hoped. So uh, I, like Dr. Beckelman, are going to diverge a little bit from what I was assigned, um, although I will reflect back on adoption of, of technologies, um, not just accelerated partial breast radiation, but also some slightly lower tech um, approaches in breast radiotherapy. And I think that it's, uh, it's nice to follow on what we could do with what we can learn from what we've seen in the past. Um, so just to uh, get everyone on the same playing field, it's important for everyone to recognize that the role of radiation therapy in breast conservation has been firmly established by trials done decades ago that have demonstrated a significant reduction in local regional recurrence, um, improvement in breast preservation rates. This is an extremely important part of therapy, and we're looking at differences of, you know, 30 plus percent risk of recurrence in the breast without radiation therapy if a woman undergoes a lumpectomy, reduced to 10 percent or less with radiation. So a very, very important part of breast preservation as an approach. And subsequently, combination of the evidence from all of those trials in an individual patient data meta-analysis has also established that there is a very small but real um, survival benefit from radiation therapy. So you can see over here the very large improvement in recurrence risk from radiation therapy, and here that modest sort of three-ish percent improvement in survival. So how can we improve on something so great? Well, radiation therapy is associated with toxicity, burden, and expense. Conventional regimens of radiation treatment involved six weeks or longer of daily therapy. And this was thought to compromise access to breast conservation as a treatment. So women might be receiving mastectomy when they might have preserved their breast because of the burden associated with radiation therapy. And so ideally, we would try to identify patients in whom we could safely omit radiation altogether. And for those who are likely to benefit from radiation, we would identify ways that would be possible to administer it more quickly with either equal or better efficacy and equal or lesser toxicity. So what we'll talk about over the next few minutes are some approaches to doing just that. Um, specifically, we'll talk about three approaches that vary in the level of technological sophistication associated with them. So the simplest and lowest technology thing we can do is not administer radiation at all, omit radiation therapy altogether, selectively omit radiation in the patients who are unlikely to benefit and treat patients who are likely to benefit. Then I'd like to characterize sort of a middle ground of whole breast hypofractionation. This is, as you've heard, the approach of shortening the course of treatment. So instead of giving treatment over six weeks, maybe giving treatment over three or four weeks in bigger daily doses. And then there's a much more high-tech way of doing this, and that is to target only part of the breast. And by targeting only part of the breast, being able to give even bigger doses of radiation, such that radiation can be accomplished in one week or less. And the goal here today will be to compare and contrast the level of evidence that supports each of these approaches and to evaluate the patterns of uptake to see what we can learn. So let's start with the rationale for selective omission of radiation therapy. It's a simple rationale. It's a recognition of the fact that although there's a similar relative risk reduction with the administration of radiation therapy, not all patients have the same baseline risk of recurrence. And therefore, not all patients will gain the same absolute benefit. And if you look down here in this corner, where you look at the low-grade patients with um, older age who have a lumpectomy for estrogen receptor positive disease who receive a systemic therapy agent that treats that disease, you can see that the risk of recurrence even without radiation therapy is actually quite modest. And the absolute gain from radiation therapy in that group looks like it, it might not be all that big. And in fact, we have a trial specifically focused on women 70 years of age and older with small estrogen receptor positive tumors who were randomized to receiving after their lumpectomy only this medication tamoxifen or tamoxifen and radiation therapy. And what was found was very interesting. There was indeed a benefit from radiation therapy. Um, oops, sorry. Um, the benefit from radiation therapy was an improvement in local regional recurrence from 
10% of women having breast cancer recur in their breast to 2% of women having breast cancer recur in their breast. Um, so radiation definitely did something in this population. However, there was no difference in distant metastases or breast cancer specific mortality or all cause mortality. I will call your attention to the fact though that even when we've had very, very, very big impact on local regional recurrence, no individual trial with only a few hundred patients was ever able to show that 3% uh, survival benefit. That only came out in a meta-analysis. But this was a trial that was interpreted by many as presenting another option for women over the age of 70. And that is, they might have radiation therapy if they wish to minimize their risk of recurrence, or particularly um, if, they were, if they were going to receive uh, uh, endocrine therapy and they were willing to tolerate a 10% risk, they could omit the radiation therapy. So let's see whether that affected um, practice patterns. Turns out, not so much. So this is a, a study based on SEER data that just recently came out in cancer um, that shows that before the study, 2000 to 2004, 2004 was when the New England Journal publication came out, uh, the rate was about 68% in women over the age of 70, and then it dropped to about 62%. So there was some change in practice pattern, but you, know, you can sort of see here, this is not all that dramatic. And if you look at SEER Medicare data, um, you can see again that 79% of women received radiation prior to the study, 75% afterwards. And what's interesting about this study is when they looked at it by um, different age groups and life expectancies, even in women with very short life expectancy, radiation use decreased relatively little. Um, so what you could say is the 2004 paper only had five-year data, so maybe people were reluctant to apply it quite yet. But even in the women with less than a five-year life expectancy where you would find the data that were published in that trial to have been the most compelling and where the risks were not 10% and 2%, as I showed you, which were 10-year data, but were 4% and 1%, so a very, very small improvement in local control, we really saw very little decrease in use. So what's going on here? Well, part of it is that it's very hard to convince patients and physicians alike to omit treatments. Both of these groups tend to be risk averse, and we all focus on anticipatory regret. If I don't receive radiation, I'm really, really going to regret it if I recur. If I don't give radiation to this patient and encourage radiation and she recurs, I'm going to feel terrible. Physicians also face strong financial disincentives to omitting therapy altogether in a fee-for-service system, as is obvious and as we've discussed. Um, but I have to say, we haven't really succeeded yet in identifying any patients who truly receive no benefit from radiation therapy. And to many patients, that 8% improvement in local regional control is believed to be meaningful by both them and their physicians. And so maybe this isn't all about bad actors and financial incentives. Maybe some of this is a reluctance to adopt an approach that patients and physicians feel is truly inferior. So OK. Selective omission, it's the lowest tech approach, but there's some reasons that maybe it wasn't adopted. Maybe we can at least try to make radiation therapy delivery more efficient. Let's go to the middle ground in terms of technology. So traditional radiation schedules, which involve multiple small fractions of dose, um, sought to exploit differences in the DNA repair capability of tumor cells and normal tissues. And these rely on complicated models. I'm gesticulating to my department chair, who's uh, very fond of these complicated models. I will not uh, belabor the point. Uh, but they're complicated models derived from preclinical data. And more recently, some of these complicated models have actually suggested that shorter courses of radiation therapy in bigger fractions to slightly lower total doses might actually turn out to be equally effective and might not lead to excessive late toxicity in the treatment of breast cancer. Because the real concern is that if we give radiation in bigger doses per treatment fraction, the late reacting normal tissues will end up more damaged and that we will cause harm. That's the fear of going too quickly with radiation. That's why we don't give it all in one dose all at once. So what clinical evidence do we have for going more quickly when treating the whole breast? Whole breast hypofractionation. Well, it turns out that we have quite a bit of clinical evidence now. There have been multiple randomized trials in Canada and the United Kingdom that have established this approach as equally safe and effective in many patients who are treated with breast conserving surgery. The first results came out in 2002 from Canada. Now, those were five-year results. Um, by the mid-2000s, we had confirmatory early results from the British trials. 
And then by 2010, we actually got long-term data from the Canadian trial. And I think these are important dates to keep in mind because what I'm going to show you is practice patterns over time. And what I would say is that for many conservative physicians like myself, it really wasn't until about 2013 when we saw the confirmatory data from the British trials showing that there was long-term data from multiple randomized trials confirming the safety and efficacy of this approach that we felt comfortable about adopting this approach. So again, not necessarily financial bad actors here, but possibly conservative and cautious um, physicians. Um, so what we see here is the uptake of whole breast hypofractionation. And it's put in the context of IMRT, which I know other speakers are, are going to talk about and have talked about. Uh, but let me just mention that IMRT is something that is less well grounded in the evidence base than whole breast hypofractionation in any of these years. And what we see is very, very little change in practice patterns here after the Canadian trial early results, after the UK trial early results. Then we see maybe some uptick here after the, um, after, you know, sort of digesting maybe the UK trial early results, but still, these are elderly patients, low risk older patients, even patients over the age of 80. We're really not using this approach very much through about 2009, 2010. And then what we see is that even after 2010, as the data gets stronger, we start to use it a little bit more frequently, but we're still not using it in the, in the guideline-endorsed patients, patients um, to whom the trial results can clearly be generalized. We're not using it all that often. Now, some of that may be that this, this population includes obese patients who may not um, represent trial participants. Um, some of this may be that people really were waiting for 2013 to, to actually read the November 2013 publication of the long-term results from the British trials. But again, it is a bit sobering that we didn't seem to wait for IMRT adoption for uh, quite such strong evidence, but we did seem to wait for whole breast hypofractionation. And I think it's informative to sometimes place this in the, in the context of Canada. So there's two things that I'd like you to, to, to notice here. So one is, um, so these are different centers across Ontario. Um, one is that many centers in Ontario, not many but not all, there's divergent patterns. We see very, very, you know, so very little use at some centers, very high use at other centers as far back as the 1980s. This is a technique that was, there's, there's no surprise that this was the Canadian trial. This is a, a technique that is more familiar to physicians in Canada. So this is important to recognize. But what we see is that as soon as they presented, I mean, don't even talk about published, presented the results of the Canadian er trial early results, we see in centers that had lower use much more of an, uh, of an increase in utilization than we saw in the United States. And what we see is that the overall rates of use are just much, much higher in the most recent year for which they had data, which is, by the way, quite a bit of, of while ago, right, back when I was saying we were doing this in 3 or 4% of our patients. So what's going on here? Well, some of it may be that the physicians may have been more comfortable with this approach in Canada and therefore were more willing to adopt it. Some of it may be that financial incentives act in different directions in the two contexts. And of course, it may not be that one is necessarily right and one is necessarily wrong insofar as if the rates of use here are very high in patients who were dissimilar from the patients treated in the trials, perhaps that's overuse of hypofractionation. But all in all, this does suggest that there are some financial incentives that are, that are affecting American physicians' practice patterns. So finally, I want to talk about one last high-tech approach to reducing the burden of, of radiation therapy in breast cancer. So let's talk about accelerated partial breast irradiation, where we treat only part of the breast and therefore can accelerate the treatment even more. So we're not treating three or four weeks now. We're certainly not treating six or more weeks. We're treating one week or less. Um, the reason we think we can do this is that when we look at where breast cancer comes back, most of the time it comes back right in the region of the tumor bed. So maybe we could just treat part of the breast, treat with higher doses per fraction, and maybe even reduce the dose to normal tissues and reduce toxicity. Now, this is an area where evidence is actively being collected. Okay, we have results from one small Hungarian randomized trial, but we really don't have mature level one evidence from large-scale randomized trials. APBI can be administered using a variety of different techniques, and I'm going to talk about a couple of them just now in my last couple of slides. The, the original approach to APBI in the United States 
was multi-catheter brachytherapy, so implanting radiation through multiple, multiple sources. More recently, there was developed a single lumen uh, entry device that is easier for the patient and easier for a surgeon to place. Uh, and then there's external beam, beam techniques that are being developed with advancing technologies for external beam. And I'm just going to stay away from the elephant in the room, which is uh, intraoperative radiation, because we just don't have time to get into that. But um, let's talk about brachytherapy utilization. So this is the implanted radiation. Well, what we see is that regardless of whether you look at lower risk patients in whom the evidence suggests that accelerated partial breast radiation might be prudent or higher risk patients in whom one might be more worried, there was an increase in the use of brachytherapy uh, over time. And it seemed to coincide with Medicare reimbursement. And so you can see here, and you've seen this uh, curve um, from other speakers as well, that this has increased over time. Now, there was quite a bit more increase after that. And what you see here are the most recent data going through about 2010, where what you see is that in certain areas of the country, over 25% of patients were receiving brachytherapy for their early stage breast cancer. Now, that might be appropriate, and regional variation might be appropriate, because if you think that patients who live very, very far away from radiation facilities might be more uh, eager to receive a short course of radiation, this might be appropriate individualization of care. Unfortunately, when you look more closely, it turns out that patients who live near a metropolitan area are more likely to receive brachytherapy than patients who live further away. I think this is also important to note that almost all brachytherapy uh, started to be delivered with the balloon device as soon as uh, the Medicare agreed to uh, reimburse that balloon device. And this is something that um, we hear anecdotes of patients coming in after the surgeon has placed the balloon device in the patient's breast at the time of lumpectomy, and the radiation oncologist was then left in a position of either administering brachytherapy or in a very difficult situation with his referring or her referring provider um, trying to discuss why not to do this. Um, unfortunately, uh, in the early days of use of, of brachytherapy, it turns out that this actually had a, an impact on outcomes that was not the promising, favorable uh, outcome that we had expected or hoped for, but actually went in the opposite direction. So when we looked at mastectomy rates, and mastectomy can be performed because of excessive recurrences or because of excessive toxicity, um, we actually found that patients who received brachytherapy had higher rates of mastectomy than patients who received standard whole breast irradiation and higher rates of skin and wound complications. And so the concern is that in the early days of adoption of this approach, perhaps the wrong types of patients were being included. I showed you the, uh, the different risk levels of the patients and, and there was an uptick even in unsuitable patients. Um, so some of this might have been poor patient selection in the early days of the technique, and some of this may have related to lack of experience with a new technology. And it turns out that this was the case even when we administered uh, radiation to the part of the breast using an external beam. So this was a, a trial that we uh, conducted at the University of Michigan where we used a fancy form of IMRT to target just part of the breast, and we used breathing control to immobilize the position, and we thought we could get really conformal, and we thought we would do really wonderful things for these patients. And these were our cosmetic outcomes um, with a, an excessive rate of fair and poor cosmesis causing closure of our trial, very small uh, single institution trial um, confirmed, unfortunately, by a very large multi-thousand patient Canadian trial that showed that the rates of fair and poor cosmesis um, at five years were significantly higher in patients who received partial breast irradiation than patients who received standard whole breast radiation. So in conclusion, uh, the quest to identify less burdensome approaches to breast radiotherapy is a worthy endeavor. Lower tech approaches have been less quickly adopted than higher tech approaches in the United States, even when the former have been more firmly grounded in evidence. Reimbursement mechanisms can clearly create perverse financial incentives, and gizmo idolatry, this is Leff and Finnecane's term, is common among physicians and patients alike. I believe we can learn much from the history of adoption of new technology in breast radiotherapy, and in particular, need to recognize that new approaches require evidence-based evaluation before implementation. Thank you.